this is really exciting today. We have the EVGA Next Generation Graphics FTW3. I think we can all guess what this is, but technically speaking, EVGA wasn't able to confirm. So we're going to open it up and see if this is an RTX 4090. If it is, then EVGA only made, as far as we're aware, 20 4090 FTW3s in early prototype stages before they killed the whole GPU side of the business and decided to move forward without NVIDIA. So this is a very rare item on the market, and it's actually a real cooler. Like, genuinely, this is more or less product complete, ready to go, and uh, it would have competed with the likes of, for example, the Asus ROG Strix, and we are not only going to take apart the FTW3, but we also have a separate review coming up to see how it performs against the uh, other manufacturers on the market. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Core P3 Pro open frame case. Back when we reviewed the original Core P3, we praised the case for its versatility as a standard desktop PC, a wall-mounted gaming machine, or a horizontal test bench for your testing projects. The P3 is back with updates including an additional fan bracket, updated I.O. ports, and better main compartment layout to give cleaner kale management pathways. Learn more at the link in the description below. Okay, so starting out, for the RTX 40 series cards, as you all know, we've had the greats like the Night Baron, the Midnight Kaleidoscope, uh, something about brutality, I don't really remember that one, and all kinds of weird marketing and product names. And then there's EVGA, which was on the way out when all this was getting announced, so we didn't get to see the more standard FTW3, which now looking back, doesn't seem like that much of a gamer marketing word compared to the stuff we're dealing with through the rest of the series. And this is a massive fin stack. First and foremost, they're not even covering any of it with all that plastic. So the shrouding here, sorry, I have to, uh, if I take one hand off one side, I have to let it rest somewhere because it is huge. So the shroud here only encases the fans to provide some guidance for the flow, but it doesn't actually cover the fin stack, which is great. That's what you want to see because they're not blocking the air exit path. So this prototype, of probably a 4090, technically you can see it's not named that, uh, it looks like, it really does look like it would have competed with this card. If you look at these, even the fin density, the ROG Strix has a much less fin density, fin pitch is all the same, they're all 90 in their vertical top to bottom orientation, but the density on EVGA is, is crazy. It adds a lot, ton more surface area. It looks like almost uh, two to one for fin density. Now, before we really get into the teardown on this, we're going to do a walk around of the card because uh, this isn't one you're going to see popping up everywhere. So we'll take some more time on it externally, do some measurements, things like that. So uh, first of all, let's look at, well, just on the front, they're using a similar fan design as previously. It's a three fan design. They have the center one bumped down a little bit. And if we pull an old 2080 Ti, I think this is, no, this is a 3090. Pull an old 3090 cooler, you can see they did the same thing just with a lot more weird bulbous things in the design, but the design for the fan placement is pretty similar. For the fins, looking down there, it's really simple. They're just top to bottom. Now, technically speaking, this isn't done. They had more work they wanted to do on it, so we might find some stuff that's not quite perfect, and that's to be expected. And as we get into the teardown and looking over this thing some more, it's really special because this is, as of right now, the last video card that EVGA made. They only made a couple of 4090s, sorry, next generation graphics. And uh, unless something changes, they're not planning on ever making video cards again, but we'll see, it's possible. So looking around some more, you can see um, the next generation graphics conspicuous sticker and above it, this is actually super cool. They didn't have this previously and I'm a big fan of it. So there's a VBIOS switch, which has been around. So that switch right there, that's just an OC VBIOS and a normal VBIOS. And normally that will give you two different power targets or at least just a backup in case you kind of brick one. And the part I like that's new is there are LED indicators. There's a really good use functionally of LEDs where you can see it'll, this will light up white when it's in normal VBIOS. It'll light up white here when it's in OC and that one dims. So it just tells you very clearly glancing at the card which VBIOS are you in, which is a super nice feature. Now something else that you'll notice looking at the card like this is that they've moved the 12 plus 4 pin off to the side. So this allows you to route the cables. Most likely they would be routed this way in a case and uh, some better cable management options to get that 90 degree mount just coming off the side of the card 
right there. And also on this side, there's a couple of pinouts in here where this is actually, this is concerning to hold with one hand every time I do. Uh, there's an RGB header in here so you can synchronize the RGB lights in your case to the cooler on the card. It's not new. And then there's a fan header as well so you can have a fan follow the GPU uh, temperature and spin up and down. So something like the H5 Flow, as weird of an example as that is, you could hook in the toilet bowl bottom fan to this to spin it up based on GPU load. Externally, some other features here as well. So the shroud alone is thick. That's to accommodate the fans and the casing around them that adds flow guidance. The whole card is around four slots. We'll have to look at it in the review. We'll tell you exactly what it is in our standalone review video later. You can see some perforations here. There's not a lot of holes in the, the uh, laterally here into the fin stack, but the ones that exist are to allow some air to escape this way. It also helps to reduce some turbulent noise because you're giving the air a path out other than just whistling through uh, top and bottom or through the um, heat pipe channels. On the back here, you can see some more perforations. Same thing, there's some uh, pin fin holes in the fin stack that go this way and uh, those will allow air to exhaust out the back. But we noticed in testing, because we already tested this thermally, that there's not a lot of air exhaust back here. So this is an area EVGA could have improved and maybe they would have if they had enough time uh, to actually finish it if they wanted to ship it. On the back, also on the cooling solution, you'd see they've got an EVGA logo cut out there in, in the PCB itself, it looks like. And that's for the flow through. They've got some larger hexagonal holes uh, for air to exhaust there. Not a great use of this space, honestly, but instead of using it all for flow through design, it looks like they're maybe using it instead for just surface area, for heat sinking. So we'll look at that in thermal testing as well. As a contrast, you look at the ROG Strix. This is one of the things that we like about the Strix is it is a massive flow through area. The PCB stops here and then everything else past it is just fin stack and airflow straight through the card. Speaking of that, let's look at some sizing. This one ends up being a little more reasonably sized than most of the 4090s out there. So uh, it's 12 and a half inches before hitting the actual PCIe slot cover. And then for depth, let's switch over to the calipers for that and get a little bit more accuracy. Depth, it is 70 millimeters. If you add in the fan shroud, it's actually 72.5, which puts this as two millimeters deeper than the ASUS ROG Strix card, I think. Let's double check. That's 70.3. So it's two millimeters longer this way, but you're already into, into the next slot anyway. So, and then for height, uh, actually ASUS looks a little taller here. Height from the bottom of the slot, not the bottom of PCIe, is 132 mil. ASUS is 148. So uh, that does put, actually, we need to check one more dimension. And ASUS is a 14 inch long card versus 12 on EVGA. So EVGA is actually is one of the more reasonably sized 4090s. Still massive, but uh, it is shorter by, by quite a lot. You cut off an extra two inches on the end. And one last measurement I just took as well. These fans are 100 millimeters. It's the same as the ASUS ones, but it's actually 10 millimeters larger than what EVGA was using on its 3090 Ti. So a little bit bigger there for EVGA. Now, time to actually take this thing apart. We've only got three obvious cables right now. It's those three. Those are going to be for the fans. I might disconnect those early. And otherwise, it's just going to be a bunch of screws to take out. So let's get started with that. Okay, just disconnecting the fans early to make it easier. We are going to be working on our mod mat for this today to protect the components. It's an anti-static work surface. Gives you a screw tracking grid that we're going to be using as well. And it also includes ESD common grounding points and wrist straps. You can learn more on store.gamersnexus.net and also help support our exclusive and really unique content like this. And thank you all for the support with that. Uh, okay, so, oh, actually one last thing I just noticed. The cable I sent with it is the NVIDIA cable. So it didn't come with an EVGA one like the 3090 Ti's did. This might deserve a separate teardown later. So I'm curious if this is a pre-production sample. Okay, disassembly time. So I'm gonna start with trying to get the back plate off only. And looks like this is left behind by them, some paste markers or something, but let's just take these longer Phillips screws out. I'm actually really excited to take this card apart because like I said, 
You're not going to see it anywhere else. They only made so many of these. They're never going to sell them. And this is really your your only really good look you're going to get at how this thing was built. And uh, I mean, it, they built it to real serious standards. This is a better design we've seen uh, than we've seen on some of the other partner model cards. It's kind of a shame it won't make it to market. So far, these are all the same size, which is excellent. Makes it really easy to reassemble later. Good job, EVGA. If you want a toolkit like the one I'm using, you can also grab these on store.gamersnexus.net. These are teardown toolkits that we custom make for video card disassembly. Okay. So this is probably where a nameplate or an FCC badge or a serial number would go, but it's not populated. Is this free yet? Oh, it is free. Okay. All right. Oh, nice. They went the extra mile and they actually threw thermal pads on it. When you have a backplate this size, this amount of metal surface area, mass doesn't play too much role, but a little bit, surface area really matters. You should be leveraging it. EVGA is doing that here. In fact, they've got the thermal pad sinking to uh, the backside of the memory. The memory on 4090s isn't too high flux. The power density is not that crazy, but you're still going to be able to pull some of the heat through the PCB and uh, memory's flip chip anyway, so the silicon's closer to the PCB than it is to the top of the module, although with a thicker PCB like this, it's a little harder to tell. So this is good to see. And in our thermal testing and imaging, we already saw that the backplate was spreading the heat excellently, and they are leveraging it. You can see some machining marks here, evidence of being a prototype sample where they didn't quite finish it, doesn't have the full uh, coated painting everywhere, uh, or maybe they removed something here if they wanted to make sure um, it wasn't seen or something, but probably it's just not finalized. At the top, there is a simple uh, light bar for the LEDs. No LEDs actually attached to the backplate. This, sadly, is really awesome that they didn't attach a PCB to the backplate because then when you pull it off, you don't have this tiny, this cable right here. These are typically the really fragile cables. They're often soldered, like you see right here, not connected on both sides. Those can rip if you're not careful when removing a backplate. Building it this way and using a light bar instead allows them to just keep the LED mounted to the PCB and then project the light up and into the light bar. So great use of, uh, of all the space they have and um, not attaching anything to the, the first part that comes out. That's good to see. All right, so you can see LEDs here. There's BIOS 1, BIOS 2. These are the power LEDs. And then this is the EVGA nameplate LED. And uh, we don't even need to disconnect it this time. It can stay connected. This is a four pin header. Um, not sure what that, that might be a debug. I'm not sure what that's for. Uh, it's not a fan or anything, but it wasn't in use. And otherwise on the back, you've, you've got the, uh, the EVGA logo. I'm sure they were proud of that. It's a little bit silly, but uh, it's good attention to detail, I guess. Uh, so they've cut the EVGA logo into the PCB itself. A little, again, a little gimmicky, but uh, it's hard to be too, too hard on a product that's never going to ship. So it is what it is at this point. Uh, some unclean solder marks here. I don't know if that's intentionally jumped or not. That foot to, that looks intentional. That looks like it's either, that's going to be either a FET or an inductor on the other side when we open it. You can see the solder jumping over here to this contact point. I don't know if that's, uh, we'd have to probe it. If that's just to make it work or if it was a debug hookup or what. <clears throat> There's also some controllers back here, right here. So they do have some actual logic on the back side of the board. Let's, um, let's try and take the cooler off now. I would compliment the lack of a warranty void sticker. However, probably no warranty. All right, leaf spring comes out. A lot of this is getting wobbly now. So this was loosened when we pulled those screws from the back plate. They just went into the front of the shroud. And then this, we got to pull some more screws. So these shorter screws I'm going to mark. Highly recommend this, by the way. I've been doing this more lately.
This is so I make sure the right size screws go in the right places when we're done. These are different. I think that's all free. Now we need to loosen the screws in the I.O. plate. The I.O. plate's interesting too. So they went with a two slot plate, but it extends to three to get some extra support on the card itself. That'll help prevent a little bit of sag, but without that third foot, you're not preventing all of it. All right, time to take these out. These are small. This is going to be a Phillips Zero, which we also have in our toolkit. So these are all the same screw. There's six of these in the back side. So there's your plate. Not super interesting. Got some holes and some hexagons on it. I'm normally not hesitant with this at all. But there's a very low quantity of these, so we are making sure this absolutely goes back together the way it came apart. And that was a very clean, very clean separation, so pretty happy about that. Nice. I'm actually, there's a lot of small attention to detail that they, they really got right in here. So this one's going to be really stupid to compliment, but um, all of the headers they've used so far, every single one of them has a clip on it. And although that sounds minor to compliment, a lot of times these LED and fan headers on video cards and power headers, they kind of sock it in and you have to jam them up with pliers or something into these small pinholes. Uh, so this, this is like way better to work. It saved me about 10 minutes. All right, so now we get to the really cool stuff. First of all, you can tell it wasn't fully finished. They have some machining marks here. This looks to be, this is a nickel plated plate, a cold plate. So it's copper, it's nickel plated. They were maybe in the process of finalizing, maybe they didn't get to the polishing phase yet or any of that, but uh, that's the machining marks you're seeing there. The paste application's really bizarre. I've <laughs> never seen paste applied like that. It looks like it was maybe, it looks like maybe it was a manual application, which would make sense. They probably didn't have the tooling up. The thermal pads are pretty standard. These might have changed to a more compressible pad before they went to shipping, uh, but these are pretty standard for EVGAs, memory, and uh, MOSFETs, and inductors. You can see here they're using a thermal putty. So that's what this is right here on the inductors. That thermal putty is nice because you basically just squeeze a tube out on it, and then it'll compress and conform to the surface so you get really good contact. They were lacking some contact down here, so not great uh, coverage on this bottom one. It actually looks like it maybe wasn't even contact in there. So uh, this is something that on a retail product we would be criticizing as, uh, I mean, not the end of the world. You're probably within spec on the inductor, but it should be contacting obviously, and that didn't even squish out. So that would be something we'd, we'd normally criticize as a design oversight, probably a little bit harsher on it, but in this case, um, it was literally a prototype. So. We're, we're kind of, there's no point. I mean, they're not, they're not selling it. This is a vapor chamber. There's a lot of ways to tell it. One of them is that it looks like it. But another is this little tail down here. That is where they seal off the vapor chamber. So you get that effectively vacuum seal. And that's what's contacting the GPU. It's sharing that solution with this sort of um, soldered on plate for the memory. Memory layout standard. It's got three top, four sides, and one bottom. And then the uh, MOSFETs, inductors, and caps are all also eventually sinking into this. The inductors directly, the, um, let's see, this would be the, that would be the MOSFETs. The MOSFETs are indirectly, they're going through a plate soldered onto the vapor chamber. And then the vapor chamber, the VC, contacts the fin stack through heat pipes. So we're going to need to take the shroud off now. The shroud's really easy. It's got four screws there. I've not disassembled this thing yet, by the way. We, we did testing earlier. This card is actually genuinely, I'm really excited to open this one up because uh, we'd heard about it. We were fairly certain of its, uh, of its existence in this state. But actually, I think I can openly say that. We said that in our EVGA is quitting making GPUs piece. Um, I knew of this. <laughs> I knew there were 20 of them, but didn't know if we would see them. Hmm. Not sure how that comes out. Ooh, just kidding. Oh, got it. Okay. There are screws on the inside of the 
fans at the top only. There we go. Much much easier. All right. There's the inside of the shroud. Oh, you can really see the uh, prototype status here. So up there, some kind of unclean exposure of of uh, like a plastic weld or something between the LEDs and the shroud. So there's the shroud. This is looking pretty cool. Very simple, but high density fin stack. Three fans mounted as we saw earlier, and then the guide is pretty good. They've got these larger cables where uh, they're just routing them cleanly through these built-in cable management pathways. These are good. You see these on a lot of cards, but normally they um, normally they start fusing the cables together, bonding them, or gluing them, or something. In a way, that's a pain in the ass to replace. So, EBJ has done well here. They've also routed them so that this is. The first cable, the middle fan's second, the last fan's a third. So it logically makes sense, makes it very easy to repair. It's a shame. It's a real, real shame they, they aren't actually going to be in it for this one because this is, so far, this is a good design. Great use of surface area, no unnecessary plastic appendages covering things, and a very straightforward design that's easy to maintain. I mean, that was trivial to get apart. Okay, let's look at the heat pipes. So that's going to be interesting as well. There's some massive ones in here, and you can see them at the end here. I don't know, that might be a 10. Normally, 6 and 8 are common heat pipe sizes in millimeters. It's going to be an 8. These are all 8s, so uh, larger size for the heat pipes. It's a little bit complex. Some of this assembly, some of these outer pieces, like this one, um, it would be kind of difficult to get to, although I'm not sure you would ever need to. It doesn't obstruct repair or anything. This is early early uh, molding as well. There you go. There's the heat pipes. That That's a lot of big heat pipes. There's the terminating end of a heat pipe. You can tell by how it's crimped. Two, three, four, five terminating ends. So there's two more somewhere else in there probably. So a lot of large heat pipes, they're all running, we'll get a separate shot of this, straight down and straight into the vapor chamber. So here you can see, it's kind of a hard shot to get, but uh, the heat pipes, we've got an upper deck and a lower deck, which is pretty cool. You don't see that very often in this particular way with this heat pipe size. I know that's more common with smaller ones. You can actually see it here as well through the other dimension. And what they're doing is as they run towards the vapor chamber, which is going to be uh, on, on my left side over here, that's the vapor chamber, they are pulling some of them down to contact the VC directly on top to give it more, uh, more heat dissipation potential by allowing the heat pipes to pull the heat away from the top of the vapor chamber. Okay, so that will wrap up this side, the cooling side of things. Uh, this is a lot of fins. <laughs> It's like serious fin stack. You look at the fin density on this. So fin density isn't everything because fin density increases impedance too. The, the more fins you have, the more impedance you have. It can create airflow problems and there's kind of a point of diminishing returns. But um, Asus has got a fin roughly every, let's zero this out, 1.85. So they've got a fin roughly every 1.85 millimeters. I think it spaces even more over here. That's about the same. EVGA is running a fin roughly every 1.3 millimeters. So uh, the, the, it is real, fin density. I don't know if they would have found impedance problems, but it's not quite dense enough that normally you would. So let's just confirm our suspicions. Since uh, officially speaking, EVJ told us, they sent this to us, they told us this is called the EVJ Next Gen GPU. Now to be clear, they're not making this. But let's go ahead and get to the bottom of it. What? No. It's a 4090. That's crazy. It's an AD102 300A1 qual sample, qualification sample. So, uh, 
I mean, it is, a, it is in fact a 4090, just in case anyone was wondering. So that's it for the teardown. We're going to do the review as well. This is functioning. We'll test it. We're also planning to do, I won't reveal it yet, but some additional really cool content with this card. And in the review, we'll do everything like we normally do. We'll have thermals, we'll have acoustics, flatness, probably pressure, all that kind of cool stuff. The only thing that's going to be different is, is the judgment because you're not going to be able to buy this card. So judging whether you should purchase it is obviously po a pointless endeavor. But one last interesting thing I wanted to point out with the VRM design before we kind of close this out. They've gone ahead and actually put four separate discrete corners for the memory VRM. So they've gone an extra step past what NVIDIA was doing with the FE where they had three corners. In theory, it improves the efficiency a little bit. You get closer proximity to the memory modules on all sides, allows more efficient power delivery, better uh, for thermal management as well. And then obviously the massive VRM on either side of the core uh, and even some utilization of the back of the PCB. So, I mean, they're actually, and on my comment earlier about wasted PCB space, I guess technically they're using it for the LED. They're using some of it for these controllers on the back. So it's, it's getting to use, but that's it for the teardown. It's a shame that, that it's not gonna make it to market because um, this is one of the more like serious grown up professional designs we've seen. And for EVGA, that's saying a lot. Like the, where's the clown car? Here's, here's the clown lipstick EVGA. And then you saw the one we just took apart for the next gen GPU. And um, I mean, they, they have for sure one of the, the more grown up designs that we've seen on the 4090 market right now. And it looks like it's pretty competitive for cooling as well. But we'll talk about that in the video. Thanks for watching. This is a really cool, unique content piece. We appreciate everyone's support and watching this type of stuff and sharing it. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab one of the mod mats that we did the teardown on or one of our toolkits. You can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus just to throw us a few bucks if you want to support our reporting. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.